Hello again and welcome back. Today we're going to talk about vascular plants. Now it's important that you always go back and review stuff from the previous lecture. So make sure you understand the generalized life cycle of a plant. Make sure that you um, can draw that. Okay, so look at your study guides. Your study guides will show you that you need to do that skill. So make sure you can do that. Um, make sure you know what a sporophyte is, the spore producing um, plant. Make sure you know the gamete producing plant. Make sure you understand what haploid is, having one set of chromosomes, and diploid, having two sets of chromosomes. And also go back and review archegonium and antheridium. So the archegonium is the female um, part that produces um, eggs, and the antheridium is the male part that produces sperm cells. So make sure you always go back and review and look at your study guides. Your study guides will be very useful to you for the test. Not only do you get extra credit for them, five points for each test, but you also get a fair reflection of what the test is going to be on and what things you need to focus on. So let me just refresh your memory some of the things we were talking about. There are trends in evolution that you can see in regards to um, what happens to the gametophyte and the sporophyte. In some plants, the gametophyte is tremendously dominant and the sporophyte is really, really super small. So if we see in algal cells, it's mainly a gametophyte. If we go to the bryophytes, the gametophyte is very dominant. Sporophyte is very small and insignificant. It's actually dependent on the gametophyte. If you look at the fern, you have uh, an independent sporophyte and gametophyte. So they're independent of each other. They don't rely on each other necessarily. And uh, the sporophyte is becoming larger and larger in the ferns. And in today's plants, we're going to talk about gymnosperms and we're going to talk about angiosperms. In these particular plants, the sporophyte becomes super dominant. So if you just take a look outside and look all around at trees and, and grass plants and all of that stuff, all of those things are sporophytes and they're the dominant plants. And the gametophytes are actually reduced down to just a number of cells. Okay, so we go from being a multicellular gametophyte to being multicellular but very reduced down in size. We go from having a very small dependent sporophyte to having a very, very large sporophyte with a dependent gametophyte. So those are a few trends you can see in uh, when plants go from being a little bit more simplistic to being more complex down here. So there are three variations on the gametophyte sporophyte relationship that we are going to see in plants today and that we've already seen in some plants from last lecture. If we take a look at this first uh, graphic here, we can see that there is a dominant um, gametophyte and a dependent sporophyte. You can see the sporophyte is dependent on the gametophyte. The gametophyte is the larger structure of the two structures. If we take a look at, uh, at uh, say, the fern in the second example here, we can see that uh, you have a super large sporophyte, you have an independent gametophyte, um, and, uh, and the gametophyte is typically much reduced in size. And then in the plants that we're going to see today, the seed plants, we can see that the sporophyte is huge, the gametophyte is dependent and very small, reduced down to a number of cells. So those are some of the trends you see in, uh, in the evolution. This is where we start. This is where we're going to. Perhaps in the future, um, there may not be a, a gametophyte. Maybe the gametophyte will be even reduced down even smaller. Who knows what's, uh, what uh, nature is going to produce in the future. Okay, a few more trends I want to talk to you about in regards to the evolution of uh, plants. Um, is uh, The first one is heterospory. Heterospory is a concept where plants produce two different sized and sexed spores. So we have microspores, micro being the root word for small and spore is the spore, um, is going, these uh, microspores are going to produce the male gametophyte. Okay, so that's where the sperm is going to come from. Mega, mega means big, megaspores are going to produce the female gametophyte, which is where the egg is going to come from. So that's called heterospory. And that's a, an evolutionary adaptation or an evolutionary trend you see in more advanced plants is having different kinds of spores. So 
Another trend you see is the evolution of the pollen grain. Okay, we haven't talked about pollen yet. I guess you've noticed that. And uh, but pollen eliminates the need for water in the fertilization process. So if you ever go outside and you look at your car while um, while pollen's being dropped, pollen's all over your car, and that is uh, essentially the the male gametophyte. And that male gametophyte is going to blow in the air. It's going to uh, be transmitted by, say, po pollinators like uh, insects. Um, but there is no need or very little need for uh, water in this fertilization process. So another evolutionary adaptation is the evolution of the ovule. The ovule is going to be the thing that uh, is the egg, and it occurred uh, 265 million years ago. So this ovule is a structure that's going to contain the egg um, that will be fertilized. So the ovule is the structure that contains the female gametophyte, and it becomes the seed once the egg has been fertilized. So that's the ovule. Um, we also have the evolution of the seed. The seed is a super, super complex structure. Uh, it is an embryo that's packed with a food supply, and it has a protective coating over the surface of it. So if you ever go eat a, uh, say, a, a kidney bean or something like that, inside there's going to be a little embryo, okay? And uh, there's also going to be the thing that you eat the seed for, which is this food supply that's inside of here. And then there's an outer coating that protects that for a long period of time, okay? So the development of seed is a major complex evolutionary adaptation for living on land and becoming more and more terrestrial. And instead of spores being the unit of dispersal, so if you notice in all the bryophytes and the lycophytes, it's the spore that's being released to produce new individuals. The seed is going to now be the thing that is going to be the unit of dispersal. Seeds drop, they roll, they get transported in animal intestines when animals eat them. They are planted by squirrels, but that becomes the unit that's dispersed in, um, in these, uh, these more complex plants that we're going to talk about today. The seed is kind of interesting. It can be dormant for years and years and years, uh, you know, hundreds of years perhaps even. Uh, we have major seed banks all across the world where they have vaults that they dig into the sides of mountains, and they store seeds in these vaults so that if something ever happens like a you know, um, I guess an asteroid strike or, you know, um, or say a viral infection or bacterial infection kills all the plants, we have a bank of seeds that we can use to uh, restart agriculture. But these can remain dormant for many years. Okay, so the creatures we're going to talk about today, the plants we're going to talk about today are called the lignophytes because they have this, uh, this very uh, complex structure called lignin in it that makes them very tough and strong. Um, so uh, lignophytes are going to produce structures that you're familiar with called wood. And uh, they're considered to be, these lignophytes are going to be considered to be megaphils because they have large, mega means large, phil means leaves, they have large leaves. Um, these leaves can be branching, they have lots of veins inside of them. And uh, the, the veins can come, you know, in a parallel fashion. So if you look at a blade of grass, the veins are all parallel. But if you look at something like, uh, say, uh, a white oak leaf, the veins will be branching, and we call that a netted, uh, a, a netted venation. So we have parallel or we have netted venation in regards to these, uh, the veins inside of these leaves. Now the veins are representing uh, connecting, connective, uh, excuse me, conducting tissue such as xylem and phloem. Two major groups of these lignophytes will include the gymnosperms and the angiosperms, so we'll talk about these uh, during the course of this lecture. Today there are five phyla of these, uh, of these creatures uh, called gymnosperms. We have uh, cycadophyta, or the cycads. These are tropical or subtropical plants. You may be somewhat familiar with them if you've gone to Lowe's or Walmart and seen them sitting around. Uh, people typically will buy them for house plants, but uh, they're mainly tropical and subtropical. Uh, Ginkophyta, 
is, uh, is only represented by one species called Ginkgo biloba. And this is an ornamental plant that I'll show you in just a few minutes. Um, the netophytes or netophyta are going to be uh, tropical plants um, that are not found in this area. There are some found in the United States, and we'll look at those, but typically they're in, in hot, dry, or tropical areas. The conifers, coniferophyta, the conifers, you, you're very familiar with these. If you've ever had a Christmas tree in your house, that was a conifer. Maybe if you look outside, you see a pine tree. Um, that's a conifer, so these are pretty common uh, around our area. And then the dominant group, Anthophyta, or the angiosperms, are going to be what you consider to be the flowering plants. So we have gymnosperm, which is one group of lignophytes, and then we have the angiosperm. This makes up the five phyla that are living today of lignophytes. All right, so let's talk about gymnosperms first. Gymnosperm literally means naked seeds, okay? So they're seeds, they do have seeds, um, but they're not enclosed by fruit. So all of our flowering plants are going to have fruit around their seeds, um, but uh, gymnosperms don't have this particular characteristic. Most are going to produce cones. Uh, I guess you're familiar with a pine cone. The female cones are called ovulate cones, and they produce ovules. And uh, these uh, ovules or ovules are going to be fertilized by sperm, by sperm pollen, and, uh, and they're going to produce seeds. Now, the male cone is going to produce pollen, and uh, it produces huge amounts of pollen, uh, as you see at certain times during the year when your car is yellow. Okay, so let's talk about the cycads, cycadophyta, first. These are, uh, are creatures that have large pinnate or palm-like leaves. They are uh, have a very woody stem, and they have vascular cambium, which allows their stem to grow in uh, girth. If you remember back, a characteristic of plants is that they have apical meristems, where their tips of their roots and shoots grow in length. But in these plants, we begin to have vascular cambium, which allows them to grow in girth. Okay, so that means this is the apical meristem is allowed to grow this way, but the, vas the vascular cambium allows it to grow in girth, so it can get actually wider. Um, these plants do produce male and female cones, and uh, they produce the naked seeds, which are not contained inside of a fruit. Now, they're typically dioecious, which means they have separate male and female plants. So there's male cones and female cones. Monoecious is a term we use to represent um, one individual plant having both male and female parts. Mostly cycads are going to be tropical or subtropical, and you don't want to eat them because they have nerve toxins inside of the seeds. So if you get hungry in a tropical rainforest because you're lost, I wouldn't eat anything because uh, most things there sting you. They're poisonous, venomous, uh, so uh, good luck. All right, so here's some cycads. You can see that pinnate leaf, that palm-like leaf that you're familiar with. That's what a cycad looks like. It has that woody stem, and it has vascular cambium so it can grow in girth. These are some of the locations where you might find them around the world. And uh, notice that they're in Central and South America, Africa, Madagascar, one of my favorite islands. We have them here in, the, in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, the Malaysian Archipelago, New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, and parts of Australia. Now, this is kind of a weird distribution, okay? So, uh, so cycads typically have very large, very heavy, very dense seeds. So it's very unlikely that birds are going to carry them, winds going to carry them, or ocean currents are going to carry them. So why would, how could you explain how they have such a worldwide distribution in very different places all over the world? So if you ever had a geology class, or if you remember back to earth science when you maybe you had it in high school, you know, all of the, 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 uh, the, the whole continent uh, of all the different uh, areas used to be all joined together. So North America, South America, Africa, and all of these things used to be all connected together into a supercontinent called Pangaea. 
And during the time of Pangaea, that's when the cycads evolved. And so since all the continental part plates were, or, or tectonic plates were all together, um, they, they formed there. And then as the tectonic plates began to separate from one another, they um, basically are found now on all the continents that you can see there. So the cones of uh, cycads are composed of numerous overlapping scales. I guess you can kind of see the overlapping scales in this picture down here. You can see overlapping scales down here as well. And these overlapping scales are called sporophylls. Kind of the name sporophyll means sporo means spore, leaf fill means leaf. So these are spore leaves. The male cones contain numerous uh, small sporangia on their lower surfaces, and these will produce pollen. The female cones have two large, uh, two large seeds that are produced at the base of each of their megaspore fills uh, on the upper surface. Okay, so in a female cone, you'll actually see down here that these uh, these megaspore fills are going to produce large seeds, and the microsporangia or microspore fills are going to produce pollen on the male cone that you see on the left hand side. Yeah, they have big cones. So I just wanted to show you there, sometimes the cones can be up to three feet in length. The largest of all of the tree, uh, of the of the cone-bearing plants are going to, uh, the largest cones are produced by cycads. So these are massive, they can weigh up to 95 pounds. And uh, so when you talk about big cones, cycads have them. All right, Gigophyta is going to be our next uh, member of the gymnosperm group. And uh, they are a tall tree. They have very strong, lig you know, lots of lignin in their woody trunk. Their leaves are green and fan-like. Um, the leaves are deciduous. Deciduous means they shed during the fall. Uh, and they're really pretty. I'll show you a picture of them in just a second. The male tree produces male cones. The female tree produces uh, seeds enclosed by a fleshy covering. Um, and, uh, and they smell horrible. So typically in municipal areas where they plant uh, ginkgos for um, ornamental trees, they'll, produ they'll plant male trees. If you ever have a friend that you really don't like, uh, a friend of me, um, give them a female ginkgo as a gift. And, uh, and when they start producing, uh, and when they're big enough to start producing their, um, their um, seed cones, they will smell like rotting tissue. The only living member of this group is Ginkgo biloba, and it's an interesting story behind them. The Buddhist monks in, um, in China actually preserved these in some of their gardens, and, uh, and the only reason we have them today is because of their preservation by the uh, Buddhist monks in China. They're now spread all over the world. They're doing pretty well because people plant them as ornamentals because they like the look of them. So here's the male cones, uh, and you can see at the end of the tree, let's see if I can put this in a white. So if you see at the end of the tree here, those are the male cones and blown up a little bit. You can see kind of what they look like and blown up even more. You can see what those male cones look like. Now remember the male cones are going to produce the pollen. Here's your female cones. Your female cones are, um, are, are right here and, uh, and you can see what they kind of look like. They're on a little stalk there and, uh, and they produce this little pollination droplet that you can see in the lower graphic here, the lower right-hand side. That pollination graphic uh, droplet is water and is sticky, and pollen, uh, you want pollen to stick on that. So here you can see the pollination droplet there, and what happens is pollen sticks to that when the male cone releases the pollen. Pollen sticks to that, and then as the liquid evaporates, the pollen is drawn into a little hole called a micropile, and... Uh, and uh, it goes down, as you can see in these lower graphics, the pollen will be drawn down to the actual egg, which it will then fertilize. Here's what the female cones look like. They're inside these little fleshy, excuse me, these are the little fleshy seeds that, uh, that form. And the, the eggs, uh, excuse me, the, the seed is inside of those little fleshy things. Probably they smell really bad to attract some kind of animal to, to, um, to eat them. Or to, or, or to disperse the seeds. 
So here's Ginkgo, and you can see why they probably planted his ornamentals during the fall. They have this nice golden coloration of the leaves, and, uh, and they're relatively an attractive plant. They do have these cool fan-like leaves that you can see here. All right, so the netophytes. These are plants that grow as shrubs, trees, or vines. They produce both pollen and seed cones. They produce naked seeds, which don't have the fruit around them. And uh, the members that survive today are netum, ephedra, and wellwishia. So these are what they kind of look like. Uh, I can't say that I've ever seen any of these. I have been to the southwest of uh, the United States, and I might have seen ephedra. I know I've never seen Nedum, and I know I've never seen Wellwitchia in real life. So these are how they're distributed. So you can see we're here, and uh, they're not found where we are. Uh, maybe if you're taking this as a distance course, maybe you're in an area where they might be found. So Ephedra is world, has a worldwide distribution. You can see it's in this little hash mark here. Nedum is uh, more of your tropical plant. So you can see it's here and here. And then Wellwitchia is only found in Africa. It's found in, uh, I believe, uh, Angola and uh, Namibia in Africa, so southern Africa. So this is what netum looks like, and uh, you can just see that it's a tropical plant. Uh, and maybe you, you'll get a chance to see one one day if you ever go to the tropics. Ephedra is probably more likely the one you'll see if you ever go out west to Utah or any of those, uh, you know, Arizona and those areas. That's a plant that's uh, um, adapted to those very, very arid, very dry uh, habitats. Um, they are known as xerophytes. Xerophytes are plants that are adapted to dry conditions. So this X-E-R-O is a term we use for dry. So ephedra is uh, highly adapted, uh, and you can see there's very few plants that can grow in that habitat, but it's one of them that actually can. Ephedra is kind of an interesting organism. It does produce a, a molecule, an alkaloid poison called ephedrine. Uh, probably it produces that to dissuade uh, insect uh, herbivores from feeding on it or other kind of herbivores from feeding on it. Uh, you may have taken, because you have allergies, pseudephedrine, pseudephed, and uh, this is a similar compound to ephedrine, and, uh, and uh, it's produced, although it's produced synthetically, and it's used in commercial cold medicines to, you know, to unblock, uh, you know, the mucus production. So Wellwishia is, uh, this is Wellwishia mirabilis, and, uh, and uh, it's kind of a cool looking plant. You can see some of the cones there, which is neat, and you can see some of the leaves of the plant. Uh, that's just a guy looking at the, at the Wellwishia plant, probably wondering what it is. But you can see it's spaced out. There's one over here in the background. There's one over here. But there's not a whole lot living in this desert. So this is a very highly adaptable xerophytic plant that's uh, living in the, the Namibian desert. It has two immense uh, permanent leaves, and those leaves can be split. So if you see this right here, it only has two leaves. It's just has sp it's been split, split, split over and over and over. And this is what it looks like as a whole plant. It's just a cool plant. I remember my botany teacher in college talking about Wellwishia. He actually went, he was a true botanist, and he actually went and saw all of them in, in Namibia. Pretty cool guy. So you can see this is Angola and this is Namibia and uh, Wellwishia are these little dots here and it's dis distributed in these very dry areas, in the desert areas of Angola and Namibia. All right, let's talk about some more familiar plants, the conifers. So this is phylum Coniferophyta. Coniferophyta. All right, so um, these do produce pollen and ovulate or egg or seed cones. They are going to produce seeds, um, um, you know, like some of the other plants we've talked about. Remember, a seed is a sporophyte embryo packed with a food supply within a protective coat. So they do produce these seeds like other plants that we've seen. They are vascular. They have phloem and xylem. They produce um, seeds that are naked, not enclosed in ovaries or in fruit. And uh, most of them have needle-like leaves or scale-like leaves. Okay, and that's uh, typically that's an adaptation to reduce the uh, plant from drying out or to reduce drying out um, 
plants that have huge leaves, they have the, you know, a, a problem, and that is that water leaks out of them really easily. But in these needle-like leaves, they reduce evaporation from the plant. So it reduces the surface area of the leaf. They have woody trunks and woody branches, so lots of lignin. They are wind pollinated, so the pollen is carried by the wind from the male uh, cones to the female cones. They can be a mixture. They can be monoecious or dioecious. So monoecious means that the male and female are on the same plant. Dioecious means they have separate male and female plants. Most are evergreen, but there are a few deciduous ones. In our area, we have the bald cypress. Um, and uh, this is a, well, in Virginia, we have the bald cypress, and this is a deciduous. But uh, most of the ones around uh, PH campus uh, are, are going to be evergreen, like your pine trees and your cedar trees. There are 70 genera and 300, and, uh, excuse me, 630 species of these creatures. The tallest of them are going to be um, the redwoods. And uh, that's an example of, uh, of one of the tall um, conifers. That one happens, happens to be sequoia. You can see the people down here and how massive this tree is. Follow your study guide. Your study guide will show you which of the different plant life cycles you need to be able to draw or be able to know or answer questions from. So just make sure you look at the study guide and know it well. Um, if you notice, we have common terms here, meiosis and fertilization. And, uh, and we're going to have uh, gametophytes. And we're going to have sporophytes. So the sporophytes are over here and your gametophytes are listed over here. So that generalized plant life cycle that you learned before, this is just a variation of it. I'm going to start down here with the microsporangium and the megasporangium. So the microsporangium produce, are going to produce pollen grains. So these will be the male gametophytes. And they're consisting of only uh, around three cells. So they're highly reduced. And the female gametophyte is going to be a, a made up of the megasporangium that you can see uh, here. And there is a megaspore mother cell that will undergo meiosis um, uh, to produce um, the actual egg. So if we just kind of continue on down. So here we have the archegonium where the egg is sitting. And uh, if pollen grains, as you can see right here, pollen grains make it up into that, you're going to have um, the egg and sperm cell nucleus unite together and uh, undergo fertilization. Fertilization will create the little embryo that you see down here. So that little embryo is going to be the uh, next sporophyte generation. And it will grow into, uh, into a sporophyte or into a, eventually a mature plant. Okay, so that is the life cycle of the, uh, of the pine. And uh, remember, follow your study guide as to which life cycles you need to be responsible for knowing for testing purposes. So here is uh, just a few different kinds of, uh, pine, um, uh, of pine pollen cones or male cones. So you can see what they kind of look like. Um, they're small and, uh, and they're numerous. When you go look at a pine tree, try to look and see. They usually are brown um, after the, all the pollen's been released or they're yellow when the pollen is still on them. Here are some seed cones or the female cone that will eventually produce the seeds and hold the seeds. If you ever see squirrels, squirrels will take and dig into the center, into the center of these things. These are where the seeds are going to be. Pine seeds uh, to me have been described as being very tasty and squirrels love them and they'll, they're not eating pine cones when you see them digging into pine cones. They're finding seeds there that are inside of the pine cones. So this is uh, very annoying to some people that may be allergic to it, but this is a pollen cloud. Someone shook the tree and there's a pollen cloud coming off. So these are all male cones that you can see releasing pollen. This is just showing you a loblolly pine, which is a common pine, showing you a first year cone, female cone, a second year female cone, and then a third year mature female cone where the seeds are going to begin to drop out of it. So you can actually look at a pine tree and see different generations of cones on it. They're going to be all represented on a pine tree if it's old enough. 
these are some of the pines that we have in our area. We have eastern white pine. And if uh, you ever take one of these little needle bundles, if you ever take one of these little needle bundles here, um, they typically have five needles per bundle. So you'll uh, see a little needle bundle, and then there will be five needles that will come out. One, two, three, four, five needles that will come out. And uh, so this is a very common pine in this area. Uh, a pine that used to be common in our area is called the longleaf pine. You can see it's distributed here in the United States. It's a more southern species, but we used to have a lot of it in Virginia. But um, unfortunately, the early settlers uh, uh, used the timber for building ships and building other different kinds of things. And a lot of it was logged. You can see this is a log um, a, a, a train bringing logs out. Um, and they used, uh, it's also used today still as timber in, uh, in places that it's grown. And then pine straw is another thing that it's used for. This is kind of a neat pine because it's adapted to, to uh, it's a fire controlled species. It's adapted to living in fire. If you have lots and lots of fires that spread through, they have adaptations to survive a quick moving fire. They have uh, these little needle-like bundles that protect the, the little sporophyte growing. Um, they protect it uh, from fire as it's moving through fastly. And uh, if you don't have fire, the longleaf pine can't outcompete other species such as turkey oak or blackjack oak uh, for living in that area that they live in. So you have to have fire to uh, have these organisms uh, alive. So there's unique communities that, uh, that uh, uh, are adapted to uh, fire. In Virginia, we have some of those communities, but only because humans still make fire and keep those uh, communities uh, alive. Fire is not so bad. So this is what happens when you have a fire-controlled area. It's very different than. That's a very different look than um, than in other uh, you know communities that we have in Virginia. That looks different than an oak hickory forest. Um, or other kinds of forests. You can see it's really open because the fire basically is sweeping through killing everything. It does char the the trunks of the trees but um, but they can survive it. There are species that are adapted just to living with longleaf pines. Okay so here we have the red cockade uh, woodpecker. It likes to live in the trees of, uh, of the, the, the longleaf pines and there are many uh, owls that uh, like barred owls, great horned owls, and screech owls that find their food and shelter in these habitats. There are also specific kinds of plants that can grow in these communities as well. Well, this is the pine that most people plant. At the, if you harvest trees and replant trees, a lot of people will harvest loblolly pine and then regrow them. They're a vast, very fast growing pine and it's a very common pine in, um, in Virginia. We also have Virginia pine. How about that? It's named after Virginia, Pinus virginiana. And uh, so that's uh, one that we have here on campus. And uh, it has little twisty needles. Typically, it's little two twisted needles. So the little needles are go out and branch out and twist around. And uh, two needles per bundle. Just uh, kind of in more of exotic pine. I, I just like the Great uh, Basin B uh, Bristol Cone Pine. And... Uh, and uh, it, this is uh, this particular tree over here is called Methuselah because it's no, it's thought to be the oldest living um, uh, tree on Earth at 4,841 years old. That's pretty old. So they actually have drilled a core inside of Methuselah, and they take the core out, and they can see the rings of growth, and they've counted um, it to or estimate that it's about 4,841 years old. That's pretty old. Um, in our area, we are in our mountains area, we have the Fraser fir. It's kind of a unique uh, high altitude adapted, uh, uh, cold adapted uh, species. We also have Norway spruce and white spruce. These are very common, um, these are very common uh, conifers. And Canadian hemlock. Unfortunately, our hemlock is being eaten by a bug, the, the uh, woolly adelgid is a bug that uh, you can oftentimes see that like they're underneath the leaves of hemlocks and they suck the juices out of hemlocks and destroy it. So that's an invasive species that's destroying our native hemlocks. If you were in this area in around Patrick Henry Community College, um, you know, uh, 8,000 or 9,000 years ago, there would have been a lot more hemlock. Um, the temperature at that time was much cooler and uh, hemlocks like a cooler temperature. So our 
our campus might have been a, a mixed hemlock oak forest or maybe a mixed hemlock chestnut forest. So something different than it is today. I don't think we have hemlocks. I've, I've not found hemlocks on the campus. Um, this is the eastern red cedar. These are very common trees. You'll see these a lot of times on fence posts. So if you look at fence posts, birds will sit. I don't think I can draw a bird, but birds will sit and poop the seeds after they eat them by fences. And so uh, oftentimes these, uh, these eastern red cedars will grow on fence lines. You can see over here, these little things are not berries, but they're actually cones. And these cones are used to flavor some uh, gin. Sometimes they turn bluish, but birds will go crazy over them and eat them. I've never eaten one before. I've never really uh, have tried them, but the birds sure like them. I'd be careful and not eat them, but uh, we do use them to flavor some gin. So the Coast Redwood is probably uh, the tallest tree on Earth. Uh, 379 feet um, is some of their maximum height here. Notice the star. We have a person down here. You can see how tall they are. And uh, this is just a picture over here showing you people having a party on a tree they just cut down. So that was a you know 2,500 year old tree they just cut down, and they're having a little party on it. So it seems like not very festive of an event because um, you know humans won't live long enough uh, to see those grow back. So. Um, and, and there's a little statistic down here you can see 95% or more of the original old growth redwood forest has been cut down. Thankfully, some people a long time ago in the early 1900s preserved a little bit of it for us to uh, still go and see in uh, California. So, and I guess maybe parts of Oregon as well, Washington State. Giant sequoia, these are huge. They grow really, really uh, wide in girth. Um, so they're not the tallest, but they are probably the heaviest. And uh, 1,300 tons is what a plant, is, uh, one of these trees is estimated to be in size. Gymnosperms are really cool. I, I really enjoy that group, and um, they're very common in, um, in Virginia. So Anthophyta will be our last phylum of these lignophytes, and these are called the flowering plants. They produce seeds that are enclosed in ovaries, so the ovary becomes the fruit. So if you eat fruit juice or eat fruit, what are you eating? That's right, you're eating ovaries. Never thought of it that way, did you? So these plants are vascular, they produce flowers, and there's 250,000 known species, but this number probably is very small, and uh, we discover new species, and they're describing new species all the time. So this just shows you a few examples of the of flowering plants. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, their phylogeny later. So two classes uh, ha are known to uh, to to be uh, to exist. We have the eudicotyledons or eudicots and the monocotyledons or monocots. So these are classes. Now remember, you have domain eukarya. We have the kingdom plantae, phylum anthophyta. And now the two classes would be the eudicots and the monocots. So we've learned this classification scheme, so don't forget that. The eudicots have two cotyledons. These are young embryonic leaves that help to feed and nourish the plant before it undergoes photosynthesis. They have netted venation. Okay, so their leaves, if you remember back to my little drawing just a second ago, the, the leaves are netted in venation. Their flower parts are in fours and fives, and uh, they have secondary growth. So they do grow uh, in girth and uh, or wider. So these parts in fours and fives, so they may have four flower petals or five flower petals or 20 flower petals, so multiples of fours and fives. The monocotyledons are going to, um, are going to um, be a little bit different. They're going to... Uh, they're going to have one cotyledon. Their leaves are their 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 uh, vascular tissue is going to be in parallel rows. So if you look at a grass blade, it's going to be in parallel rows. They're going to be having they're going to have flower parts in in uh, in parts in threes. So three six nine will be what their flower parts will be in and and uh, and. Uh, Secondary growth and girth is relatively rare in these particular plants. 
Okay, so let's just talk about what a flower is. I'm going to talk a little bit more extensively in another lecture on flowers um, and, and uh, the reproduction of these plants. But um, the flower is the reproductive structure for flowering plants. It is a highly evolved, adapted structure. Um, it's typically uh, going to be a, uh, uh, a short branch. It, it does have a little stem, and it has modified leaves. So all the parts you see down here are modified leaves. So the modified leaves include sepals, petals, stamens, and carpels. So sepals are these parts down here. They protect the flower while, before it unfolds. Flower petals you're familiar with. Stamens are the male part, which is right here. It's made up of the anther and the filament. And then carpels are going to be the female part. And I, I can see a little piece of one right here. But again, I'll show you a better picture and talk about them a little bit more as we, as we go further into this. Let's see if I can erase a little bit of this. So we can see this next part. All right. So um, the receptacle is going to be the place at the very base of the flower. So this is the receptacle right here. And uh, that's where the four kinds of leaves will attach to the stem. So here's a typical flower that you can see here. So you have the receptacle, the base of the flower, where all the flower um, leaves are attached, where all the flower parts are attached. We have the stem. We have the sepal. This is going to be green. It will undergo photosynthesis, and it will uh, cover the bud before it unfolds. Flower petals, if the flower has it, are a lot of times showy to attract uh, pollinators to it. And uh, we have the stamen. Men is the male part. And it's containing the anther and the filament. Anther produces pollen that will spread to the female part. The carpal is the female part. It's made of the stigma, the style, and the ovary. And, uh, and the stigma is sticky to catch pollen. The style is just a tube that pollen will grow down through. And the ovary contains the, uh, the ovules. And uh, that is where the, uh, the seeds will grow. The ovary becomes the fruit. So if you eat fruit juice or drink fruit juice, you're eating or drinking ovary juice. So how did this flower evolve? Because when we go back and look at fossil record, we don't see flowering plants, you know, uh, say uh, hundreds and hundreds of millions of years ago. Okay, but around, you know, somewhere in the 80, 70, 80, 90 million years ago, we begin to see flowering plants uh, leaving fossils in the record. Okay, so we can go back and look at fossil record and we can see that there were plants in the past that had leaves with little sporangia on the outside surface. We can find plants that are more have a folded leaf with the sporangia kind of on the inside of it. We can see that uh, in the fossil record and we can see that uh, the leaves became even more folded. So now the the um, the actual uh, eggs are going to be inside. And, uh, and these things got more and more complex. These carpels got more and more complex over time. Uh, if you ever want to see a complex, um, a complex arrangement, cut a bell pepper open, and you'll see the complex arrangement of the female reproductive parts inside. So same thing as the, as the carpel. The stamen evolved from having a leaf with sporangia on the outside surface. And then we have sporangia that uh, um, are in, in modern day flowers, we still have some sporangia on outside surface, but then some of them they folded and lost the leaf-like parts and just the, the reproductive sporangia are what's left over. So they're modified leaves. These flower parts are modified leaves. The petals are modified leaves. The sepals are uh, uh, modified leaves. The carpels are and the stamens are as well. This life cycle you'll need to know. I mean, flowering plants are really important. They're dominant. And uh, this is something that I'm going to require you to know. And in our next lecture, we'll go over this a little bit more. Let me just make you aware of some of the parts today. So let's talk about the anther and we'll talk about the ovary. The anther has tissues inside of it that undergo meiosis to produce microspores. 
Microspores are, under, are going to undergo mitosis to produce the pollen grain. Okay, the pollen grain will contain um, sperm cells. So yes, if you're allergic to pollen, what are you allergic to? Sperm cells. So here we have the ovary. The ovary is going to have uh, uh, tissues, the ovules that are going to undergo meiosis to produce the, uh, the megaspore. The megaspore will undergo mitosis to eventually produce an egg. So the pollen grain, if it uh, makes it to a stigma, which is sticky, uh, the pollen grain will grow down and it will try to find the egg cells. Once the egg cells and the sperm cells are going, uh, they unite, we have fertilization. Fertilization produces a zygote. That zygote will be inside of the developing seed. If the seed is planted, it will germinate into a sporophyte. That sporophyte will mature and eventually produce flowers where it will have the female and male parts, perhaps. Now, there are flowers that are monoecious and some flowers are dioecious. So some flowers can be male or male and female at the same time or just female only. Now, pollination is the carrying of pollen from one flower to another. Fertilization is when the sperm and egg cell unite. These are two terms you really should be familiar with the definitions of. And this is just another life cycle. Maybe this one might seem more easy to you. So either one is, uh, is fine to learn, but make sure you, you, uh, you learn it. So that concludes a little bit about the gymnosperms and the, um, and the angiosperms. So and a little bit about how the more complex uh, flowers have evolved uh, on Earth. So make sure you keep up with your study guides. Make sure you keep up with your reading. Make sure you keep up with uh, studying. And uh, I will see you next time. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, email each other, but make sure you don't sit there and, and, uh, and feel like you're alone and abandoned.